Well, today is our first Sunday of the month. We often uh, regularly uh, partake of the Lord's table and we will be doing that following the message. Uh, we'll have a, a choir a piece for you today that will try to uh, help your hearts prepare for that time. So I'm kind of looking forward to that and then we'll partake of the Lord's table and we'll be dismissed after that. But before that, gotta have a message, right? All right. A little girl was reading the Bible in an airport, and a man sitting next to her asked, little girl, do you believe everything you read in that book? Yes, sir, she said. You mean you believe that Jonah was swallowed by a great fish? Yes, sir, if that's what the Bible says, then I believe it, and I'll ask Jonah about it when I get to heaven. But what if the but what if Jonah is not in heaven, the man asked rather rudely. Then said the sweet little girl, you can ask him. <laughs> Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Let's pray. My father, thank you so very much for this day you've given to us. We are grateful for the word of God, how precious it is to us. We do want to pray that you will continue to teach us from it. We do want to pray you will enlighten our hearts as we call upon the Spirit of God to do the wonderful work that he has been sent to do in our minds and our hearts and helping us understand your blessed word. So we do want to pray that each one here today knows you, uh, that each and every one will understand uh, Romans chapter 4 and what we're looking at today in uh, the precious scriptures there. And we do want to pray that uh, as we depart here, that we will go away stronger and sounder in your blessed word. Through Jesus, we give you thanks and we pray. Amen. What saith the scriptures is the question Paul asked his readers in Romans chapter 4 and verse 3. What is the divine and infallible truth that we base all our beliefs upon? What does it declare? That's a really important question. Shall we honor God's word this morning? We're going to uh, jump into a new chapter. We finally finished chapter 3. We're going into Romans chapter 4. So shall we honor God's word? If you're able, if you're not, that's fine. If you're not able to stand... But if you are, please stand and we will read Romans 4 and the first eight verses. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found, has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has nothing to boast about but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works... The wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputed righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and those uh, and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. Please be seated. You know, in that particular passage of Scripture, uh, I sometimes love reading those passages, and you just want to say amen when you get done after reading these wonderful truths. You know, Satan has from the very beginning been mixing truths with error. And you know the story and how that began in Genesis. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave it to her husband with her and he ate. And we drop down to verse 19. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground for out of it you were taken for dust you are and to dust you shall 
return. Well, Eve bit, right? Eve bit, and her eyes were open, and she did become her own God, knowing good and evil. But these truths were mixed with a lie. She died. She died right then and there spiritually, later physically. Satan is the master liar. He not only is a pro at lying, he's actually the father of lies. And he is not interested in truth or life. He's about deception, rebellion, and that which is counterfeit. Satan's about elevating himself and bringing havoc to the Lord's people or bringing the rest to hell. His chief means of deception, counterfeit, and corruption and death is to mix truth with error so that the stream of truth that's pure and clean and vibrant with freedom and life becomes muddy and murky and filled with all kinds of debris so that it's cloudy. It clouds the pure, clean truth with bondage, corruption, and death. Romans 4 is the great Bible chapter on salvation by faith alone. Now, many claim to believe in salvation by faith, but not in salvation by faith alone. Now, herein is the, the bite that mixes truth and error that ultimately brings death. The word alone is the watershed issue which divides the muddy water from mixing with the pure, clean, good news of salvation. For example, many believe in salvation by faith but their faith is in things like sacraments, like baptism and communion. And to them, this is the means of receiving Christ and having faith. You see, they don't really believe in faith alone. There's this deadly mixture with truth and error. Many believe in the value of the shed blood of Christ. We're going to be celebrating that and we, when we finish the message today. But not in the value of that blood alone, for Christ's sacrifice must be accompanied by any number of things that we put the title that Scripture does, good works. Many accept the fact that Christ is mediator, between God and man, but not that Christ is mediator alone. For some, they use Mary. For others, they use priests. For some, they just trust in the church. And all of this is utterly false. Many acknowledge the authority of the scriptures, but not the authority alone. Along with scripture comes church fathers, the church denomination, tradition, and who's ever in the position of influence or leadership at the moment. And if you notice over the history of the church, that changes, that truly changes, depending on who's leading at any particular time. Now, with so many intrusions of error, we must ask, as Paul did, what does the Scripture say? That's really the crucial issue here. What does the Scripture say? That is the only authority we have to know conclusively that what we believe is not a lie of the wicked one, that it's not something that has been passed on by traditions of men, or that it's not some private interpretation or some mixture of truth with error. Are we saved by faith alone? 
And verse 5 really does answer the question in our text. But to him that does not work, really important, I would underline that, wouldn't you? But he that does not work, but believes on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. The lie of Satan founded in religion, whether it be under the name of Christianity, Mormonism, Jehovah Witness, Muslim, Judaism, or some other pagan or primitive belief, is that by one means or another, man can become right with God by attaining righteousness by something other than faith alone, grace alone, and Christ alone apart from any works. They are continually throughout human history and church history adding works, which ultimately corrupts the doctrine of salvation. And we've been studying about some critical things in our Sunday school class, and one of them is sound doctrine. One of the most important skeletal truths that the church must have is sound doctrine. And while many people know this, it's still very good for us to actually establish in our hearts and our minds sound doctrine. And scripture teaches in our text that both David, Israel's greatest king, and Abraham, from whom the whole Hebrew race has come, were both, were both saved by faith alone. Our text draws on these two individuals. But it's very interesting to actually review some of these individual lives. So if we take a look at Abraham, he did not have anything in himself to boast about before God, and neither does anyone else. Well, consider him. When God called Abram, which was his original name, he was part of a community of thoroughly pagan and idolatrous people. We are given no reason as to why Abram is called except that it was God's sovereign choice. God simply chose Abram out of the thousands inhabiting the city of Ur. That's all we know. That's what it states. That's what we understand. I'm like the little girl who said, if that's what it says, that's what I'm going to believe. And after commanding Abram to leave his country and leave his relatives and go to the land that would be shown to him, he actually got up and he went. He believed God and off he went. And while Abram left his homeland and his friends, he did not leave all of his relatives. In a sense, he only partly obeyed, bringing his father and nephew Lot with him. Abram wasted 15 years in Haran, where all lived until Abram's father, Terah, actually died. And after that, he continued on to Canaan, but guess who he took? He still takes Lot with him. Now the Lord continued to speak to Abram, assuring him of his unconditional promises. But after arriving in Canaan, he was faced with a famine, and he turned to Egypt for help instead of God. And while there, to protect himself, he lied to Pharaoh, saying that Sarah was his sister, and in so doing, Abraham dishonored God and caused plagues to actually come upon Pharaoh's family. The Lord gave repeated assurance to Abraham, who responded in faith. But again, when testing comes, and believe me, your faith for its genuineness will always be tested. It'll always be tested. Do you really believe it'll be tested? So the Lord gave repeated assurance, but then the test comes. 
and he relied on his own judgment rather than the Lord's word, and he committed adultery with Hagar in hopes of having a male heir. We know the story. And this disobedient act, again, caused misery to the innocent as well as future misery to his descendants. For from Hagar came Ishmael, from which came the Arab people, who have been in constant conflict with the Jews ever since they were in their beginning. Now, despite his disobedience, sin and spiritual imperfections, Abraham always comes back to the Lord in faith. The Lord honored that faith and counted it to him as righteousness. Now, Abraham could never have been justified before God based on what he did. For what he did was anything but righteous when you actually look at the man's life. Abraham was chosen by God's sovereign elective grace, not because of his works or even because of his faith. His faith was accepted to God only because God graciously reckoned or counted it as righteousness. It was not the greatness of Abraham's faith that saved him, but the greatness of his gracious Lord in whom he placed his faith. Faith is never the basis or the reason for justification, God declaring you righteous, but only the channel through which God works his redeeming grace. Faith is simply a convicted heart reaching out to receive God's free and unmerited gift of salvation. What was true in regards to Abraham's faith is true in regard to everyone who will be saved. And although faith alone is required for salvation, it has no power in itself to save. It is the power of God's redemptive grace alone, working through the atoning work of Jesus Christ on the cross and resurrection that has power to actually save. Faith is not, as some claim, a type of work. Paul here makes it clear that saving faith is completely apart from any kind of human works. Romans 4, 4. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. Now think of it kind of like this. When a person works for a living and gets their paycheck, you do not receive that wage because your employer graciously provided it for you. He didn't give it to you, your paycheck. He didn't give you this paycheck because of unmerited favor that you don't deserve. You don't, he didn't sign your check as a display of love and mercy and kindness toward you. No, your employer provided you a wage only as you provided for him your time and your labor. Only after you have worked do you rightfully receive reimbursement for what you have done. And because of your work, your employer, your employer owes you. It's a debt because you have an agreed wage. And once paid, you put the money in your pocket knowing you have been reimbursed for your time and your labor. But that is not, that is not the way it is with true salvation or in that matter, justification. God declaring you right. Now, shocking as it may seem, 
The person Christ saves and justifies, providing him with righteousness, is the one, first of all, who does not work. We stressed that before, we'll stress it again. What is meant by that? You renounce any possible possibility of earning salvation in any way. You disavow any personal merit or goodness. You acknowledge that all your best labors are as filthy rags and can never fulfill God's righteous demands. Instead, you believe on him who justifies the ungodly. And that's where I am, right? Justifies the ungodly. Romans 4, 5. You don't take sacraments for salvation. You don't reason that you have lived or tried to live a good life. You don't try to live by the golden rule. And you don't compare yourself to others saying, well, I'm not as bad as that guy. And you don't say things like, well, I never murdered anybody. Why would God send me to hell? None of that stuff that we sometimes simply call good works is acceptable by God. You simply, you simply come before God as an ungodly, guilty sinner and throw yourself on his mercy and grace trusting in Jesus as his substitutionary sacrifice for your sin on the cross, and that's it. Anything more, anything less, then it is a corruption of salvation, a lie that actually leads to death. Now keep in mind, the primary purpose of the gospel is not to save men, but to glorify God. That's why, as a, as a church body, we do want to go out and try to evangelize people. We want to go out to try to share Christ with people who may not know him. Why? Well, they do need saving. We certainly don't want them to go to the place God has prepared for unbelievers, hell. But we do it for a greater reason, and that's his glory. When people come to Christ, it glorifies our Savior. And that's what we're about. That's why we do what we do. And only faith in Christ alone brings him glory. Trusting in your own goodness does not bring him glory. So the very second that you trust Christ to save your wretched, sin-hell-bound soul, God imputes and imparts righteousness to the believer. God not only considers believers to be righteous in response to their faith, but actually infuses them with his own divine righteousness. And that's exactly what happened to Abraham in verse 3. What saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. So before the cross, the believer's sin was paid in anticipation of Christ's atoning sacrifice. And after the cross, the believer's sin has been paid in advance. So whether before or after the cross, the means of salvation has been the same. Faith, grace, Christ. That's it. Turn with me to a very interesting passage in John 3. And I often don't connect it, connect it with this, this, this verse that's right in, it, in the mix of it, but I, I often don't connect these two verses with verse 16. John 3, 14 and 15 says this, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Now, <clears throat> to me, you know these verses 
but they precede, you know, John 3.16. And it's talking about Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness. And this is given as an illustration as to how people actually were saved. So here we have the Lord dealing with a rebellious, sinful people. And let me just read in Numbers what happens. Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpent from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent, and he put it on a pole, and so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Then you get John 3.16. Here we have the Lord dealing with a very rebellious, sinful people. Poisonous snakes were sent to bite the people. I hate snakes. How about you? Poisonous ones are the worst ones. I hate them. They give me the willies just even looking at them. Poisonous snakes are sent in to these people. They repented. People came to Moses acknowledging their transgression and then asked him to intercede for them with the Lord. Repentance is part of saving faith. Moses then goes to the Lord. The Lord answers his prayer with one of the strangest commands I have ever read. And I don't know, sometimes you read the Bible and just scratch your head, don't you? This is a weird one. Moses is told to make a serpent of brass, put it on a pole in the middle of the camp for all to see, and if anyone is bitten, they were to look upon the serpent of brass and be healed. Now, here really is a wonderful example of salvation by grace through faith alone. How would you and I have responded if we were actually given a command like this? You've been bitten by a poisonous snake. You're going to die. You're told to look at a piece of brass shaped like a snake that bit you, and you will live. Sound odd to you? Now, to most people, that proposition would seem absolutely absurd. Why? Well, think about it. There's no therapeutic value in looking at a serpent made of brass. I need a cure, an antidote, a potion, a drug to counteract the poison. That's how we think, right? But the people were not told to make for themselves any remedy whatsoever. None. They were to cease from any human effort and turn to a divine one. Sin, Satan's poison, runs in the veins of all humanity. And nothing but death awaits them. But instead of trusting in what God says, people rush around in the fury of religious mixtures, performing all sorts of rites in Christ's name, chastening the flesh, 
conjuring up all kinds of methods, rules, fasts, pilgrimages, instead of looking, looking to the crucified Christ in faith and end up eternally lost. The poisoned Jews were told to look up at the brazen serpent fixed on a pole and live. Pretty simple, right? Pretty simple requirement. But today, instead of looking up to the cross, a very simple command, like in gone by days, people who have been bitten eagerly try to help those more advanced cases, thinking that if I sacrifice and I serve others, that God will look on what I do, and therefore I will help myself by helping others. And they imagine then, in themselves, their social service, serving other people, will actually find themselves in an eternally heavenly place by what they do. And they're in for a horrible shock because they're going to be found eternally lost. When you have been told to look up, just look up. Now, it's not by helping others that the poison of our sin and its bite can or will be cured. And I also can see people who are dying of the venom of the snakes trying to fight off another further attack. Let's exterminate the fiery serpents. And so a zealous society for the extermination of fiery serpents is then formed. People are urged to join, contribute, and take up the cause. A poisonous victim rumbles around in his pockets and he actually gives to the society for the extermination of fiery serpents. And a year later, he dies and he ends up in hell. There is not one line in all of the Bible that teaches that we must fight against sin to be saved. Christ's hatred of sin was manifested in dying on the cross in order to furnish life to those who would believe his word. His life freely given would then enable the believer to partake of the Lord's nature and furnish the base from which sin could be overcome. We fight sin by lifting up the cross and proclaiming faith in Christ, not by fighting the serpents. You know, you know what else I see people do? They pray to the brass serpent on the pole. A sinner is not told to pray for salvation. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's a good prayer, right? That's a good prayer. And you must have that kind of repentant heart. But he has told you and I to believe, not pray. He's told us to believe, not pray. Prayer will be used in expressing your faith, but prayer does not save. Faith saves. There is yet another thing I can see people doing before the brass serpent, and instead of looking up, simple command, they will bring an offering they will bring your heart to God. Set it at the altar of the brass serpent and you will be secure. No unbeliever is told to give his heart to God. An unbeliever is told to believe in thine heart. What a difference that is, isn't it? 
Tremendous. Don't bring your heart to God. He said, believe in your heart. There's a tremendous difference between the two. You see, I, I started off explaining Satan is a father of lies. And he provides us with this terrible mixture of truths. Believe in your heart about the blood of the cross. Only a Christian is told to give his renewed heart to God. What does God want with an unbeliever's dirty heart anyways? And him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted to him as righteousness. One other thing I can see people doing in the camp of the Jews to be cured, and that is to get some relic of the brass serpent or splinter of the pole on which the serpent was lifted up. They will think it will protect them. And there are so many Christian relics in Christianity from the cross that people wear to the cross that people do, to the statues people have, to people even relying on having the Bible as though it is going to protect you, thinking that if these things be in our possession, we are okay. Let's see what happened in history. 2 Kings 18.4, and we'll close. He removed the high places and break the sacred pillars, cut down the wooden images, and broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days the children of Israel burned incense to it and called it Nehushtan. Nehushtan. You want to see absurdities, just look around Christianity. You want to see foolishness? Just look around Christianity. Look around what people actually are trusting in that really has nothing to do with what God actually says. The Jew had been bitten by the serpent. We have been bitten by sin. They were dying. We are dying. The thing that had bitten them was made in the likeness of brass and put on a pole, and people were told to look. Look. Only look. And they'd be well. They had to have faith in what God said to actually live. Now, Christ was made in the likeness of sin's flesh, and made sin hanging on a cross. And I assure you, on the authority of God's word, that God will freely justify anyone by his grace, if you will but put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who has already died for your sins, and you will live eternally with him. Satan will do all he can to provide a mixture in this particular truth. We, of covenant community, can allow any mixture. We want pure doctrinal truths. And hopefully today, that is what we've heard from Romans 4. Pure doctrine, faith, alone. Let's pray. My Father, thank you so very much for your blessed word. It really clears up so much, and it really removes a great deal of debris that's so, so prevalent in religion today. We thank you so very much. You have been so kind to us to expose us to that which is true and right in your sight, and we do want to pray you might help us as those who have put their faith in you to really have a pure stream of sound doctrine that flows in our hearts and minds and out of our mouths into people who need to just look and have faith themselves. Through Jesus, we give you thanks and we pray. Amen.